everyone, my name is Zach Redrup, this is the It's Not A Phase podcast, and on this episode I'm joined by Lauren Babick, who is the vocalist for Red Handed Denial. The band have just put out their fourth album, A Journey Through Virtual Dystopia, so we talk all about that, its message surrounding our relationship with social media, the rise of AI in music, her other musical projects, and loads more. Before we get started, if you enjoy this podcast and you want to support it, there's a few ways that you can do that, and they all only take a few seconds. You can hit subscribe or follow wherever you're listening to or watching this. You can leave a review or a comment. Give it a follow on social media. And if you want to go the extra mile, there's also a web store or you can join the Patreon. You can find the links to everything I've just mentioned in the description of this episode, or you can head to itsnotaphase.co.uk. But for now, let's jump right into my chat with Lauren. What's up, everybody? Thank you for joining me on this episode of It's Not A Phase, where I'm joined by Lauren Babic of Red Handed Denial. How's it going? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Of course, of course. And, you know, when we put this out, obviously the album will be out for people to enjoy. But today is the day before the album release. So uh, very excited, nervous, just lots of things going on. Kind of all of it all at once. Um, Kind of just prepping all the last minute little things before the release and I'm hosting like a little listening party tonight so it's just time to celebrate and finally get the music out to everybody yeah to share it with everyone that's uh eager to listen to the the full thing especially after the the free singles you put out so far everyone's loving it so far so only good things yeah I'm I'm excited to hear all the feedback about the full thing because it is definitely a deep album and I think you're going to get something even more dynamic than what we've brought to everybody so far. So I'm, I'm excited. Yeah. Well, recently you guys came off a tour supporting on process. How was that? That's, that must've been such an awesome tour. It was incredible. Like I think when you're supporting a headliner, it's always a little nerve wracking going in. Yeah. And it's always like, okay, what, what's, the band going to be like? Are we going to vibe? And I can, without hesitation, say that they are some of the nicest people and one of the nicest bands we've ever toured with. Like, just an absolutely amazing group of people. And even their crew was just wonderful. Like, we all just had such a blast. And the shows were amazing. Everyone was really receptive. And um, the crowds were amazing. So it was just an all-around good time. Yeah. That makes such a difference, doesn't it? Like you could have these this tour where all the shows are brilliant, like the crowds are great, but you want to actually gel and vibe with the people you're touring with as well. Yeah, yeah, and you never know. Like you, yeah. you just never know before you get there. And you know, we had all those, all the visa issues in the beginning, and we had to. Red Handed couldn't play three of the shows because of all that. But like, oh, no. it it was a little bit disappointing in that way, but. I think with tour, you just have to be flexible and take things as they come. But like, it was just an overall great time. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, on the subject of touring, I know towards the back end of last year, you came over to my side of the pond. I think that was the first time you've been over here. My first time ever performing in Europe in the UK. And like the London show was just one of the most memorable shows I've ever played. Like you guys just went extra hard like it was so sick it was yeah. amazing did you do much traveling like uh exploring while you were in the uk at all or um it's a little tough on tour because it you know the schedules are usually very tight and mm. i i just try and enjoy the drives like as as you're driving up you know especially to glasgow it was such a beautiful drive seeing all the farms seeing all the all the hills and the sites like I I just try and take the drives in as much as I can because you never really know the day of how much travel time you'll be able to have yeah um but I did what I could and we we walked around in Glasgow in Glasgow in London and just checked out like the stuff around we went to a pub uh after the London show so it, it was a good time awesome awesome yeah I think that as well like you would have noticed the the shorter drive times as well, like as opposed to like touring in the US, like you're driving for six, seven hours to get to one show to the other. Whereas 
in the UK, you're traveling six, seven hours to get to pretty much the other side of the country. Yes, it is very, very nice to to tour in Europe um, because everything's so close together. And it's Yeah. always nice. You get a little bit more time to just breathe a little bit outside of a moving vehicle. Yeah. And hopefully Yeah. you get to come over here sooner rather than later. Yeah, we're we are trying, at least with red handed, we're trying to get like a good opportunity to come over because obviously it's very expensive. It's very risky. You want to make sure that everyone is good financially and want to make sure that. the whole thing is feasible so we are looking to to get ourselves over there too Yeah, you just need the right tour and at the right time as well. So yes any promoters and booking agents listening, if yes you can sort that out, please get it sorted. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess, you know, in big news that we, you know, touched on briefly at the start, album number four, A Journey Through Virtual Dystopia. mm-hmm Almost, you know, fallout boy sentence, long title, yes um, which will be out by, like say, the time people hear this episode. How are you feeling about finally getting this album out there? the people to hear. It's funny you say the follow up boy title because that's exactly <laughs> that's exactly what we said when we yeah. were naming some of the songs and the title of the album. Like it's obviously very long and clunky, but so is our band name. Um, Yeah. it feels so good to finally get this album out because we really feel that just the whole process with the with the album album and recording it, it was finally like we we finally did it right. And in a way that we've always wanted to do it, which was in, in one period of time. Um, so it feels really good to give everyone an album where we live and breathe the process from front to back. And I think the songs definitely reflect that. And our sentiments reflect that just looking back on the album and, and listening to the songs. Like, we're just so happy with it. And, and it definitely represents that... exact period of time when we recorded it and it feels good Yeah, I guess that's the the great thing about albums, isn't it? Even though, obviously, over time you want to improve as artists and as a band, they are snapshots of who you were as a band and as people at that time. mm -hmm. it's like a little scrapbook to to look back on and with our other albums and eps something always happened like we always got struck with like bad luck and The, the process was always drawn out way longer than we intended or or it needed to be. Yeah. So there's there's always like little resentments that we look back on, like with Redeemer and Wanderer and uh, I'd Rather Be Asleep and even Stories of Old. Like there was always something detrimental that happened in the process where we look back and we're like, oh, when I listen to these songs, it just reminds us of that. But with this one, It was finally, finally right. So it feels, everything feels good. That's good. That's good. Well, from what I read, uh, I believe this album is largely about like our reliance and dependence on social media, how that kind of affects our mental health and relationships and everything in between, I suppose. How do you feel your relationship with social media has changed over the years? Oh my God, I'm such a loaded question. Like, I've I've been doing this with red handed denial and just as like a like a solo artist for all, almost 15 years and it's it's like red handed denial was kind of the first project that got me into singing and I I learned how to sing being in this band and just the way that we promote ourselves and live online has changed so much over the course of me being a musician that like it's gone through these like eras and and periods of time but i feel like especially post pandemic like coming out of the pandemic there's been this like massive shift in rewiring um i mean the pandemic re rewired our brains but like i feel like coming out of it we're trying to like get back into the real world but still have this like massive dependency that we had during the pandemic on social media and and technology that like it's almost like we're relearning how to be like people and now with the introduction of 
like TikTok and the vertical scroll, like like the infinite scroll, I feel like that more than ever has like changed the way that we ingest media. Mm. And just with the album, th this massive shift, um, even for myself personally, more than ever, I've wanted to just like throw my phone into the ocean and just forget about it. But then it's like, oh, but if I don't do all these things, will I even exist as a musician to everyone else? And it's like these almost like these existential crises we have on the daily of like who are we are we anybody and like what is my worth and I think anyone in music now struggles with this and it's like where do we fit in in this mm -hmm. like weird in this weird landscape yeah it's kind of like that weird well I guess people joke about it when they say like just as an example like if you share like a run you've just been on like if I don't put it on social media, did it even happen? Like they exactly. say it's a joke, but it's, it's like it, there's some truth to that. <laughs> photos or it didn't happen. And yeah. I'm I'm noticing like now the people we follow, like our actual friends, I haven't seen posts from my real friends in like ever. And I think it comes down to even the way that these apps are exposing content to us. Like it's that has changed. And I notice, like, we've become these, these, like, pawns to, like, please, please the algorithmic gods. And, and it feels just so transactional. Hmm. And, and I've noticed, like, just that over the past two to three years. And it, it's, it's almost become like, oh, well, I, well, I have to do this. And then you post it and, and then I can barely, I barely have, like, the mental bandwidth to even, like, read comments anymore because i'm just like i don't know i don't even know it's real anymore <laughs> it's yeah. like crazy <laughs> yeah it's unfortunate isn't it because like social media nowadays is like so embedded in our lives in terms of mm -hmm. not only as a tool to like promote if you're like a creative or you're a business but also to connect with other people and you know to a degree if you are a creative or a business if you want quote unquote success like social media is kind of almost a necessity at this point which yeah, is it, yeah it almost like that's that is your resume and it, it everything else is kind of secondary so it's like being a musician it's like the music the actual music is only a fraction of what everything else has to be and it's like oh well how many how many followers do you have on tiktok how many monthly listeners do you have on spotify and it's like okay these are good analytics but does it actually represent the quality or or the hard work or the intention behind everything? And yeah. lately it's just felt like, you know, it's affected even personal relationships. And I'm I'm sure many musicians can can relate to that. It's like, oh, well, if you don't post anything about your your real friends or or even like your partners or your your significant others, it's like do they exist in your yeah. life and and that can cause problems when you're just trying to promote your art but like you also have a life beyond that and it's yeah it's just this crazy struggle of like how do we how do we manage all that with it with the just information overload yeah it's just the constants of it like if i like i know that I, if i'm posting like on tiktok or on reels i have to post like every other day or something like that and I've got like a notes of like different ideas I, I've, mm -hmm. I've got like planned but sometimes I just look at it I'm like I can't even bother to do this but I know I've got to do exactly yeah. and every every person I talk to like no matter what like creative vein they're in like whether it's it's podcasting or react content or mu like music or yeah. you know anything it's like we have these lists of of things we want to post, but then you look at it and you immediately feel like, oh, I'm exhausted. And it's yeah. like, I don't think we ever intended or 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 wanted to be a million things at once. Like I, I always say, like, I just always wanted to sing and make cool songs. Yeah. Like I, I don't think I ever wanted to be this like this persona that always had to be on all the time. And 
it it's just the burnout is so real and it can be so real if you don't know how to like touch grass once in a while it, and it, it it's become something else it's it's just so interesting to watch and I'm I'm a little nervous to see where where it goes in the next like year or two years or five years like it's it's a almost a scary thought Mm. Well, I guess you kind of see it on in like songs on TikTok as well. Like you get these songs going super viral for these, for lack of a better word, like soundbite moments. Like you look at "To the Hellfire" by Alana Shaw. You look at the "Summoning" by Sleep Token. Like I'm not trying to discredit those songs. Like they're they're great songs, but though they have their moments, which is what's pushed them to become viral and then become successful. But in that happening, you've got. A lot of like genuine songs just getting lost in that dump Mm pile -hmm. of the infinite scroll that you, you mentioned. And you also have other people looking at the success of those songs like that and looking at it in the lens of how can I include a viral hook moment in my song as opposed yeah. to writing a song which just so happens to have such a moment. Yeah. And I think the intention behind a lot of art these days is getting lost and i don't and we are seeing a lot of like really disingenuous stuff as well just to try and like try and get that viral moment but and i think it's to the detriment of of genuine art and honest art and i think we're seeing a lot of that too and i always say like thank goodness a band like sleep, sleep token went viral because like I was a fan of them for so long and I was like, yeah. yes, finally, like <laughs> one of the good bands like has has their viral moment. I was so happy. But like yeah. you also wonder like all those bands that like don't go viral because there is a luck element that mm, you know, there, there is that luck element. And it's like if you don't have that viral moment versus if you're not a legacy band who has a major label backing yeah where do the thousands of other really good bands where where do they get to be like like when do they get to have their moment and yeah it, it's a struggle and and it's it's almost like they get lost in the ether and i i feel i feel for all those bands and i, I do feel like red-handed denial has fit in to that massive group of bands where like you know we haven't really had a viral moment but we also are for all intents and purposes, an independent band. And we've been doing that for for a long time. And it's like when you don't have all that money to sink into ad, uh, like sponsored content, where where do we fit in? And it's it's so interesting. And, and you have to like really have a lot of like mental fortitude and mental rehearsal of like, this doesn't define my worth and this doesn't define the quality or or the art that we make and it, mm. it's such a struggle yeah and then you've got like the i guess it's a completely different conversation but somewhat linked you have the rise of ai and you know i guess oh theoretically within a click of a button someone could i uh, copy your voice and make a song without you even knowing all your concerns about whatever <laughs> it happened so i don't think i've heard any music content yet but someone found this site called character.ai right. where you can go and you can go and talk it's kind of like chat gbt but you can go and talk to like famous people and they looked me up and you can have full conversations with me and we we did it and my inflections and my cadence it's all bang on and I, I was like no way and then you can see how many people had conversations over 700 people <laughs> and I was like no no way so it's already happening to me and like I think the day that I find like an AI song made with my voice maybe then I'll be like really freaked out yeah and that's a whole other issue of like copyright things I don't even know but I think it's just such untouched territory and like it's getting so normalized now that it's like, oh my God, this can, this, this is on the the precipice of like spiraling out of control. Um, and it, but it's already happening and it's already there, which like yeah. freaks me out. Yeah. There's this one AI band that, they call, have you, they're called Boy What, have you heard of that? 
the plankton it's i think it's called plan z and yeah. what's scary <laughs> is like that song is so good like yeah. it's an it's an actual bop and that's the scary part and it it just brings up all these like moral and ethical questions of like is like what does it mean like what does this mean to art and music and i it's just it's scary but cool but weird i don't even know like i think the i just don't even know how to feel about it yet because mm. it's just so new but i think people using it for like entertainment purposes like to hear to hear toad sing chandelier is kind of funny and yeah. it's entertaining but um i feel like we are on the precipice of something like that could be very like dangerous to art yeah it's crazy because like i'm a big fan of the weekend and I, I think one of the first like big like ai duped songs was a weekend song and when i first heard it mm -hmm. i was like is this like a new song he's put out and it, i had to like dig in to find that it was ai i was like this is getting a bit scary now yeah yeah, yeah. well it's, yeah what do you like if we're if we're kind of linking this to the album with the talk of social media and AI, how do you see us reaching the end of our journey through this realistic virtual dystopia? I think the scary part is there's like infinite possibilities. Like, like Dr. Strange says in like Marvel, like that we don't know. And I, I think the unknown, like the unknown factor is the scary part because we know where it could go. You know, we've seen all these like dystopian movies of like the end of civilization and stuff, but Black Mirror. We've seen Black Mirror, which <laughs> is like, you know, I think the most extreme uh, scenarios that could happen with with tech and AI. But I like I would like to hope that it will help us, but uh, my faith in humanity is not very high, and I I know that people who are greedy and want to get ahead um, and, you know, corporations with a lot of money, like there's a lot of scary things that could happen. And I think we just have to be, we just have to use our critical thinking at, and stay aware and stay alert um, with this constant ever-changing um, thing that's happening and, and just, make sure that it doesn't spiral out of control or make sure it's not too late. Mm. And I don't think I have any sort of solutions. I think the whole album is more just like my feelings about it and me feeling so many different emotions about how it affects us now and how it could affect us later. And yeah. I, I think it's just all a massive conversation piece that we just have to be very on top of and think about yeah on the yeah. daily well let's move away from the the doom and gloom of <laughs> modern day technology let's move to i mean this is the day before your album comes out so let's get to you know some lighter topics yeah I believe the writing of this album you went a bit of a different approach was it i think you focus more on at least at a starting point like vocal melodies and and arrangements as opposed to i think in the past a lot of songs started with like the guitar line is that right yeah we kind of flipped our songwriting method uh we kind of did a 180 so anyone who's been a fan of the band knows that like we're we're no stranger to like very busy guitars um very very math math core very um technical and shreddy guitars but what happened with our writing is that I would get I would I would receive the riff salad and then I would try and put vocals on top of it. And I think we we've written a lot of incredible songs with that method. And I think we've gotten a lot of like heavy stuff. We've gotten a lot of technical stuff, but it was always so challenging. And, and we really felt like we wanted to give my voice the best opportunity to shine with this album. So we we chose to start the songs with the vocal in mind first. So we would usually come up with the chorus melody and then determine, okay, 
what is the best key and and how is the key going to to evolve throughout the song and then we would build around that and it i think with songs especially like one more night and my demise like we're we're getting keys that allow my voice to do things that it can do and and songs like father said on the last album um because of the key that it's in it was so challenging for me to come up with the voice lines and the melody lines because of just my range and it was just so much easier and more freeing this time around and i think we just got better songs out of it cuz we could we could just focus on songwriting instead of being sort of locked in a box of like okay here's the key here's the riffs now now what do we do so it it just allowed so much more did you play any of these new songs on the, the last tour that you just did with with unprocess did you showcase any new ones yeah yeah we we led the set with parasite so actually parasite was song 1 in the set okay and then one more night we played that throughout the whole tour so half the tour the song didn't come out yet so people got a taste of it before it re was released and then uh the song was released about halfway through the tour so that was kind of a a cool one to play live because it's very obviously super different than anything that we've ever really put out before yeah so it was just cool to showcase the depth of the album with just two songs um yeah. but I think it would it's just so refreshing for us to just try new things and yeah. and show people like oh we we aren't just like a a shreddy band with a, a lot of like Nintendo music. I call it Nintendo music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean the reason I ask is cuz just with the way you described like how you've arranged these songs this time as opposed to in the past is like I guess if you're putting vocals first this time maybe there's less of a um I guess encouragement in your mind when you're going for the, the riff salad as you said before to do sometimes these complex like vocal stuff that some when it goes into live it's like how how often can I kind of pull off this crazy shit I did in the studio that happens every time though like regardless <laughs> of of any songs or albums that come out whenever it's time to play them live for the first time I'm always like fuck <laughs> Oh no. Like, in the foot a little bit. What did <laughs> I do? Like I and but thankfully it was a little bit easier this time because when you have a song that's in a perfect key for your voice, it's immediately a lot easier. So Parasite is really, really like it's in a nice sweet spot for me. And it was surprisingly a lot easier to do um than previous songs so <laughs> it was it was nice to to like approach that song for the first time and figure out like okay how am I going to do this live and how is it going to be comfortable for me yeah I think um didn't Chris take on a bit more of a production role this time around as opposed to like your, your older works yeah this was the first album that he is officially co-producer of the album and he has really brushed up on his production skills and now he's like fully producing bands and and running his own studio out in Toronto so he he was able to bring in even more of his um skill set and and influences which is why you're going to hear like a lot more industrial elements to our album way more synths way more EDM elements cuz a lot of his wheelhouse is in like lo-fi and EDM so I, I love bringing that stuff into our record and I think like it's just going to showcase so much more depth for us. Yeah. Well, yeah, you've touched on the like the C the synth and EDM kind of influence, which is much more apparent in this record. Mm -hmm. um, is there any kind of apprehension when you branch into like these new areas for the band where like if, how is this going to sit with the fans? Like how are they going to? take to this new direction that we're we're going into i think any rhd fan knows like we really don't care like what genre we are because we never really know i think i think any obviously like metal is a massive umbrella as a genre but we're no strangers to like genre bending like 
we we obviously have our technical moments we have our metalcore moments we have our gent moments we have our classic metal moments and i think bringing in even more um genres outside of metal i don't think our fans will be too surprised um but i will say like you're not gonna get as heavy of an album that you're used to uh sonically at least but i think lyrically and emotionally this is probably like the most like heavy album that at least i've been a part of for rhd because i think it is the most vulnerable next to i'd rather be asleep which was very much about like my mental health struggles uh during the pandemic and and just my general mental health but this one you're getting so much more um just sentiments about like relationships and and still mental health and just like a really like present record and a lot digging into like a lot of past trauma for me so um definitely very heavy on the emotional side and exploring genres like emo and post rock and and more of that midwest emo vibe uh, that you'll hear near the end of the album mm. so i think i think people won't be surprised but i i think it's going to also be a pleasant surprise to see like oh so that's where they went with this album and it's just places we've never gone before as a band yeah, yeah. were these kind of sounds that you've wanted to explore as a band in the past like more than than you have done like before this record because obviously anyone who knows you knows that you are a fan of metalcore as much as you're a fan of pop and R&B. Exactly. And I think like with the methods we used for writing this album, you're going to get just such a wider range of every single one of our influences. Um, And I think every band member is equally represented in this album. And you're not just getting like, here's a ton of riffs with Lauren, like doing what she can on top of it. It's more like, (laughs) a fully cohesive representative rep- representation of who we are as people and what we listen to because yeah. like i i listen to so much r&b and pop more so than any metal like i i don't really listen to a lot of metal and i i've struggled with connecting with any new uh metal that's come out even in the past five years like i've really just had trouble like latching onto a lot of it so I always find myself going back to to artists like, you know, Adele, Amy Winehouse, SZA, uh, her, like just just powerhouse women in pop and R&B. And you're going to hear a lot of that on this album. And, um, and also bringing in like our, our like 2010 love for like, Zed and Avicii and David Guetta and Attack Attack even like you're gonna hear a lot of like nostalgic stuff and anyone who also listens to like Crazy 88 like you're gonna hear a little bit more of like that post hardcore element too and then it's just so cool to to bring those things into Red Handed Denial um and to just evolve our sound in that way Mm. because we've we've always wanted to be a little bit more palatable because our, our songs are like, we know our songs are like crazy and a lot of people do have trouble following like a lot of the shreddy stuff. And I think mm. that was really reflective with the reception of I'd Rather Be Asleep. Um, so we we kind of took that and just made a super cohesive album. And I don't think we lose, we, d- we didn't necessarily lose the shreddiness, but um, you'll hear it throughout but in a really tasteful way yeah it's a bit more refined i guess exactly considered yeah exactly i think we really matured with this album and um it's like a fine wine i think we it just shows us growing up and 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 also not caring as much not overthinking it and we were we were just able to to really just say fuck it and not overthink things and not overcook it which we are very good at so <laughs> we definitely love to overthink things and it was really it was it was just really freeing and and in i can listen to the whole album and and be like wow like i actually really enjoy it 
Is that the first time that's that's happened with an album after you've put it all together, do you think? I think I can officially listen to Dystopia and be like, I like every song and I can listen to this album from front to back and be like, this is just a good album. These are just really good songs. And we that's exactly what we wanted. Like we didn't want to write anything for the sake of anything. Like we didn't write anything with like, oh, we have to make this heavy. We have to have a breakdown here. Oh, but what will the people think if we don't put a bleh? And it's like, <laughs> I, I think that was just so nice to not buy into any fads or or have any like intentions that didn't come f directly from what we wanted. Yeah. We did exactly what we wanted. Yeah. Well, you, you mentioned briefly Crazy 88. So, you know, for other people listening, that's your other band that you sing in. Yeah. And, you know, you've got a lot of other projects. You've got like a million projects on the go sometimes. A like million. Sky Limit. And then you do all these collabs <laughs> with people. And yeah. You sing on video games. Like that's just a small handful do you ever find it difficult finding the balance to to do all these things I think it's like a weird ebb and flow because I always secretly think that I'm not doing enough which is really <laughs> weird to say but then when I'm in the thick of it all it's like oh my god there's too much going on <laughs> so right now like rolling out an album during tour just those two things, like managing those two things was a lot. I was like, how are we supposed to roll out an album when we have all these cool tour photos? So like it it was just so much information, so much content. But um, we try and space it out. Like, obviously, I'm not going to I'm going to tell Jared, be like, don't drop a Crazy 88 album during a Red Handed Denial release. So just coordinating with everyone. Um and making sure like we're communicating and you know everyone in my projects and my collaborations is super accommodating like no one no I I pick and choose like who I work with because everyone is freaking awesome like even the the people in Sky Limit like I love them some of the most you know chill and wonderful people and everyone is just like super chill and that's kind of the goal that I I set for myself is like work with people who are kind and professional and and just just homies like I I, yeah. I love working with friends and you know the rabbit hole is very deep I have like I think now it's over like 200 songs that wow. have been released and that like saying that number out loud is like crazy to me but I just I try and be present and be like wow like that's really cool like because it's really hard to not like be like okay what's next what's next I gotta do this I I gotta stay relevant oh my god like it's it's it can get very stressful but always just like remembering like wow like look look at all the things I've done and like just be appreciative that people are still enjoying it and people are still you know listening it's 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 a lot but I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. It It's so much fun. And I'm grateful to just be even in one band, but to, to have three bands yeah. or two and a half bands. Sky Limit's like a fake band, but like yeah. we are going to make more music. Like we're in the process of doing that. Um, And to have like this whole other realm of like, you know, solo stuff where like anything goes. I do, you know, covers and original music under my own name. It's like, a lot but i would not trade it for the world yeah. it's like a beautiful chaos <laughs> <laughs> well you mentioned your solo stuff and your covers there so just for people listening who don't know that you do covers i mean just a, a small selection you've done like covers of lincoln park of billy eilish lamb of god celine dion north lane <laughs> spears quite a, quite a selection how do you even go about deciding what you're going to cover is it literally just oh i like this song i'm going to put my own spin on it Covers are, like, my fun time. So, like, <laughs> you know, it is, like, it is a massive source of, like, income. So to call it, like, my day job is, like, a very, like, weird way of calling it. But it is, it is like, my fun time. And, you know, I just try and pick songs that I love. And I think that's, like, at the core of anything I do. It's, like... I have to love it because I know if I love it, I'm going to I'm going to do a really good job and I'm going to have fun. And at the end of the day, that's all I want. And 
you know, there are a handful of of projects that I've done that I didn't necessarily want to do, but it was like a homey favor or like, you know, it was it was just good timing and and you know, wanted to keep busy. But so there's obviously a handful of things that like, you know, looking back on it, maybe would I have done that now? No. Uh, you know, like Popular Monster, for example, didn't even know that song before I covered it and then, you know, covered it for because Hallucine, they're my good friends. And it's like, all right, I'll do the screams on it. And then all of a sudden that became a thing. And I was like, Ugh, all right, I guess I guess that's one of them. But, you know, mm. it is what it is. Like, it's all part of the journey. And I I I just try and do things that I love. And, and sometimes, you know, anyone that makes music like sometimes the things that you put like the most blood sweat and tears in is like sometimes underappreciated but then the things that you like just threw together and didn't really care about or thought twice about that's the one that like is crazy so it's just interesting to like go through it all and and just see what happens I, i just throw shit at the wall and and see what sticks and and you just hope for the best and and people ask me like oh my god do you plan out all these things and and how do you like think of these things it's like I don't (laughs) like I really don't I just like I think of an idea and I was like all right let's do it and then we do it and then say say a little prayer and and see what happens you know yeah but it's all at the end of the day you just got to make sure it's fun yeah that's the the main rule I think yeah yeah well, just because we brought up a few minutes ago, for the Crazy 88 fans, is there any stuff in the pipeline on the horizon that you can talk about? Or yes, um, you know, obviously we're we're an online international band with like three band members from different three different countries. So it it's been to get any Crazy 88 music is miraculous. Um, but yes. I, I have officially recorded two new songs for Crazy 88. I am vocally finished with those. Um, Jared is the mastermind behind Crazy 88. So whenever he's finished with with all the little edits and, and fine finer details, I, I can say that a very overdue, um, weird, deluxe, burning alive thing is happening so you're gonna get like at some point so you're gonna get uh two new songs a lot of remixes um all the instrumentals to burning alive and whatever else jared thinks of (laughs) (laughs) but yes there there is new crazy 88 on the horizon which is really exciting the two new songs are are very reminiscent of like you know the the two sides of like nitroglycerin and tears and rain when those came out like it mm. it's very much reminiscent of those two songs cool. so i'm excited so keep an eye out for them yeah yeah and just kind of looking back a little bit and reflection i noticed this year's 15 years since the first red handed denial release which is the eyes and liquid skies ep so oh my god yes how are you feeling like if you kind of look back now I think and I know it's a bit of a big question but what are your thoughts on not only the band's growth and evolution but kind of yours as well as a, a vocalist and a person since this band began I guess you grew up with this band I did like you can you can listen to every release from Red Handed and hear like physically how I've grown and I think like like listening back to Eyes and Liquid, Squ- Liquid Skies that was the first thing that I ever recorded period so it, it okay. you can hear just how new I am at it and you can hear how my screams aren't really developed yet and um there's like no auto-tune on that no vocal processing whatsoever it is like me in my youngest most rawest form ever um but I love that like I think it can be very scary for a singer to like have things that exist that are just like so not where you are now but i love i love how people can see that growth and and see like wow like look where look where this band used to be like look where lauren's vocals used to be and look where look where they are now and it's just you can literally watch me grow up with this band and i think that's why this band is so special 
to me and why we've always made sure to to like I don't know it, it's just a family like this band is like my family and to hold it very close to our hearts and and not let any anybody like taint the band and 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 ruin it which is why like we're still independent like we're on a very indie label um they're basically just helping us with a little bit of like funding and that's it like everything else is us and it always has been us and it's just it's cool to see like the evolution of of where I've been and where the band's been Yeah, and you can look back at that very first entry in the scrapbook that you mentioned before and just... yes my very young self I literally sound like a baby on the album but it's it's cool like we we always joke about like should we should we like remix it or like redo any of those songs but I, I don't know I think I think leaving it and and allowing it to be just a photograph of of our younger selves is is kind of cute I like yeah it yeah well look into the future this time what other plans so far for 2024 for for you guys yeah like we're gonna just enjoy the album release for for the next couple of weeks and just like rest after the big long tour that we just did for the month um we don't have any like any tours or shows scheduled for the band as of yet but we are looking we're we're looking we're looking for the best opportunities that make the most sense for us uh i have a few solo shows in the winter like kind of the first solo shows where like i'm i'm gonna headline and and gonna be super like punk rock about it i'm probably gonna do like you know door sales and stuff and just like have have fun in like small clubs because that's kind of where i love i love like the small small and intimate shows yeah um but yeah red hand is just gonna enjoy the album release we're gonna promote it we have a few more music videos on the way and kind of just see what the world thinks of it and and see what opportunities um present themselves with with the new album awesome well thanks very much lauren really appreciate you taking the time and diving into you know the, the album and its message and the, the perils of social media and and all that stuff um before I let you go and enjoy the rest of the day and obviously the the album launch, any final words, anything you want to say or plug, floor's yours. I thank you so much for having me on the show and taking the time to to hear me ramble. And um any to anyone listening, like thank you so much for spending the time with us. Um and I hope you enjoy the album if you get around to listening to it and it really was a labor of love and and i appreciate you and i'm i'm super grateful for for anyone that does take the time to uh to check out the band so but yeah just thank you awesome yeah thanks again lauren i'll uh, i'll let you go take care of yourself thanks zach take Bye. care and that's it thanks so much for tuning in to it's not a phase if you enjoyed this episode then don't forget to hit subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes leave a thumbs up if you're watching on youtube follow the podcast on social media, and maybe even join the Patreon or grab some merch from the store. You can find everything that you need at itsnotaphase.co.uk. That's itsnotaphase.co.uk. Thanks again. Hopefully catch you on the next one. And remember, it's not a phase, it's a lifestyle.